Hi, everybody. Hi. How's it going? <laughs> My favorite part of the week. <laughs> How's everybody doing this Wednesday? Oh, let me pull that together a little bit so you can see me. There we go. Hi. How's it going? <laughs> Today is, we're telling you that uh, we're talking about, well, but technically we're talking about um, sparkling wine that is um, made with a traditional method. So I'm sure for those of you who know, you probably uh, noticed <laughs> that our topics of champagne, cava, and cremant all have a very important uh, element in common, which is how they're made. So that was kind of what we were going to dive into today, which I was very excited about. So I'm curious. So I know that I posted, I've got the... Um, the Juve Comp, the Reserva de la Familia. This is one of my favorites. It's like super, super delicious, um, Brut Natur Cava. That's it. So I guess I'm gonna go ahead and just get started with this lovely little shindig. If you're not familiar, um, you know, if you have any questions, just feel free to shout it out in the chat or whatever. All right, lovelies. So uh, talking about uh, champagne, cava, and cremant, one of my all-time favorite topics, because who doesn't love it? Um, and I think it would be very sad if you didn't, so I, I feel bad for you if that's the case. <laughs> but you probably wouldn't be here if it was, so that's the good news. At any rate, um, so we, if anyone was with me way back in the beginning, which I think most of you were actually, uh, you know, we started off with Prosecco, right? Suzanne, you're drinking Prosecco. So the interesting thing is that um, not all sparkling wines are created equal, literally, because there are different ways of making sparkling wine. All of them include, of course, the capturing of CO2 in the bottle via, via um, specific methods, which we're going to talk about today, one of them. Ooh, Bailey Lapierre. Yay, Michael. Um, I love that one. And then we've also got, uh, you know, different methods that are much cheaper. Like if you buy something that costs, you know, maybe two fifty or three dollars, there's likely it's just carbonated, which is another way of making sparkling wine, just like you would make any other sparkling beverage. But we here obviously care much more about the uh, the the nice ways of making it and the ways in which it tastes very very good. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the traditional method is what we're talking about today. And so traditional method sparkling wine refers to the process of the, the making of the sparkling wine. And the, the definition of traditional method is really that it in involves two separate fermentations. And we're going to go over the method of making this because this is really the critical point. Um, because the method is really what creates the nuance, the uniqueness, and the, um, the flavor and aroma profile of this entire genre of sparkling wine. And it's very different from Prosecco or any kind of Charmant method that you might also enjoy. And I'm not saying one is better than the other, I'm just saying different. And it's important because the method of production is what makes it so different, right? So um, the idea is that there's two fermentations and we're gonna talk about this. You start with a base wine that's fermented. Um, that's the first fermentation. Then there's a second fermentation and the second fermentation, this is key, has to happen in a bottle. So it's not necessarily the bottle that the wine is purchased in or that it's eventually sold in, but the second fermentation does have to happen in the bottle. And we'll go into why this is important as well. Um, because it is that, that, that small space that creates the unique aromas and flavors that are distinctive in these particular styles of wine. And the important thing to know is that traditional method is used all over the world. So it's not just, we're obviously gonna talk about um, some old world regions in this one. When we touch on that, just some of the main ones, because Champagne, Cava, and Cremant are three of the most typical traditional method sparkling wines that you'll come across. Um, and, and Champagne is by far and away the most distinctive and the most well-marketed of all of them, of course. But the idea is that everywhere in the world, uh, it's made here in the United States, it's made Australia, it's made uh, Tasmania. I don't know anyone who knows Jan's really, really beautiful Tasmanian sparkling wine. And they have a very cute thing. They say it's method Tasmanois. Um, I always get a kick out of that. So I, one of my favorites as well, but again, all over the world. So it's not just isolated to any particular country or region, this method. 
Um, so the history of sparkling wine, I always like to talk about this because I think it's fun because the, the, the truth is, is that sparkling wine exists as a happy accident, right? Um, we are very, very lucky that at some point someone decided to take what was originally thought of as a flaw in wine and mass produce it so that we could all drink it, right? Because um, the reality is that uh, the capturing of those CO2 bubbles was happening naturally originally. And I mean, winemaking has been going on for thousands and thousands of years. And originally, no one understood why it was happening. Um, but the transition from uh, the idea is that the transition from still wine to sparkling wine was this evolutionary. It wasn't, it wasn't a single discovery. It wasn't one person deciding like suddenly, oh, I found it, voila, here's the sparkle. Um, but what was really happening was this, is that in the colder regions, and this is specifically, we're talking old world again, we're talking generally in France, um, we're talking places where in the wintertime it would get cold enough that they were making, people were making wine, and the wine would ferment in the fall, but it would get cold pretty quickly on and the fermentation wouldn't finish. So they wouldn't know that because at that point they didn't understand what fermentation was or that yeasts were eating sugars and creating alcohol in the wine. They just knew that uh, it was time to put the barrels into the caves or into age or into just store. And so while these, the wine that they had made was being stored, the, the yeast got so cold that they had to stop fermenting which meant that they would seal off these barrels, store them away, and then um, over the winter, the yeast would just be dormant. They would just be asleep and, uh, and nothing would happen. But in the springtime, when the weather started to warm up again and it started to come, the temperature started to come up into the caves or into the storage, wherever it was, the yeast would wake up and they'd be like, oh, cool, there's some sugar in here, I'm gonna eat it. <laughs> And then I'm going to make some more alcohol. And as a byproduct of that, I'm going to make carbon dioxide. And now that this is happening in a sealed container, the carbon dioxide was getting captured into the wine and basically dissolved into it. And that's what creates the bubbles. Yeah, the bubbles that are in our sparkling wines. And this is true of any sparkling wine, except the, of course, if it's uh, carbonated. But the idea then is that um, originally, therefore, when people were drinking these wines, they were thinking that this was some sort of flaw that had happened. Uh, typical, like you would think. But um, the the uh, it was in the uh, in the 1500s uh, down in the south, south of France in Limoux where they were like you know what we actually kind of really like this and they started to try and figure out how that was happening and try to recreate that special um, that special process that made it kind of uh, something that they wanted to achieve as opposed to an accident a happy accident now um, one of the things that was happening too the the uh, Dom Perignon of course is often attributed with discovering uh, Champagne, which he did not. But he was a monk that uh, he was, he basically tended to the vineyards in Champagne for a very long time in the 1600s. And he was vital and critical to the evolution of Champagne wines, still wines in particular, because for the most of the history, Champagne actually created still wines and a lot of them red. But what happened was while Dom Perignon was overseeing the vineyards and the cellars, the wines were being bottled, put into the cellar, and in the spring, they would burst because of this fermentation process happening. It creates a lot of pressure. So your typical bottle of champagne has about five to six atmospheres of pressure, which is a lot. So you've got, you end up with um, all of this pressure and really, really flimsy glass because glass production at that time was not up to the par of what we are right now. So it was the second step of actually being able to uh, create, capture the bubble, and then market it was the advent of stronger glass bottles, which actually came out of England. Um, and so they were able to create uh, by use, it was actually, it was a situation where they were needing all of their wood. This was, uh, again, this was in the 1600s, but they were needing their wood for, uh, for building ships to, to build up their navy. And so that's when they started using coal. And coal actually created hotter fires, which then, when you're with glass blowing, made the glass stronger, thicker, and more durable. And then these thicker, stronger bottles were actually able to contain all of the pressure that was being created by the second fermentation. So this was a huge step in being able to then mass produce and market as sparkling wine and champagne, as it were, as we sort of refer to it at that point. Um, but that was that was sort of that process. Um, the the funny thing is that Dom Perignon, um, who's very well known as sort of, uh, you know, the master of champagne, was actually responsible and he was tasked with removing the sparkle from the wines originally. 
<laughs> so he was sort of like, it, it was, he was up to his eyeballs and just sort of a nuisance because of this exploding bottles in the cellar. But what he did do in spe specifically in Champagne, what he was um, very, very important to the process of making Champagne was he was sort of initiated the concept of blending and the concept of blending parcels or wines from different parcels, wines from different vineyards. And if anyone's very familiar with Champagne, it's, it's pretty much all a blend from lots of different vineyards, from lots of different grapes. And it's this idea also of lots of different still base wines, which is again, part of the process that we'll talk about. Um, and he was really responsible for sort of promoting that and using that as a way to make better quality wines and also kind of uh, create um, better vineyard management. He actually was a great vineyard, so he was able to uh, really, you know, work in the vineyard to produce better yields, higher quality yields for the grapes in general. So that was really important. Now, another very important person, of course, is Barbicole Ponsardin. Um, she's the widow Clicquot, which in French, some of you may know more familiarly as Veuve Clicquot. And um, she actually, it's, it's a really fascinating story. If you ever get into the history of Champagne, there are lots of women lots of women who are really, really at the helm of the importance of champagne. And she's one of them. So she actually, uh, she became widowed at 27, very, very young. But at that point, she actually took over uh, the vineyard and the entire establishment and the company. And she was responsible for sort of, uh, for really bringing champagne wines in terms of marketing, in terms of uh, production to a higher, higher level. Um, some of the things that she is, is very important that she uh, helped develop, she actually technically one of her employees um, were created what we call um, uh, pupitres and those are we'll talk about this but that is the process by which you kind of remove the yeast from the the bottles during the second fermentation again when we get to there you'll see what i'm talking about but she's responsible for creating that and that was huge to be able to sort of mass produce in that time um, champagne and sparkling wines in this method. And she also was the first one to create a vintage champagne. So uh, up until that point, it had always just been a blend of many different years. Champagne, you can have, um, you can have blends and reserve wines that go back you know, tens of decades, if you'd like. Uh, but in this particular uh, instance, there was a very, very bad vintage, um, a, a few vintages that were very, very bad. But then in 1810, suddenly they had a really great vintage. So she decided to celebrate by creating a vintage champagne. And that was the first one of its kind. So when we talk about the process of traditional method, it gets kind of tricky, but it's super, super fun and geeky. So basically what we do is we start off with still wines. And in particular, I'm gonna use champagne as my example because this is really sort of where this process was, uh, was, was generated and, uh, and exemplified. Um, but let's say you're in Champagne and you're making still wines and it's cold in Champagne. So generally you're gonna pick those grapes and they're gonna be kind of almost underripe. So those base wines that you're making are gonna be super, super high in acid and low in sugar and low in alcohol. So they come to about maybe like, maybe maximum 11% alcohol because, and they're super high in acid and you actually wouldn't wanna drink them on their own, right? But these are the base wines and this takes care of the first step, which is the first fermentation. So your second step, if you're making traditional method sparkling, is that you're gonna blend a bunch of these still wines together. Again, they're all super, super highly acidic. They're not really tasty on their own, but you as a master blender are gonna know, you're gonna be able to take little bits of these different, um, really, really um, ass assertive and aggressive <laughs> youthful wines, you're going to blend them together to make what's called a cuvee, which really just means blend. Um, and that's your assemblage. That's the process of, of putting together what's going to be the finished product of wine. Then what happens is you go into your uh, your prix de mousse, which is a, a very fun way of saying capturing the bubble uh, in French. And that is where basically this new blended base wine uh, at about 11% alcohol is going to get bottled into individual bottles, very important part. And these individual bottles, 750 liters, uh, milliliters, I should say, 750 liters would be huge, uh, 750 milliliters, these wines are going to be um, in that very, very small space. And that's very, very important. And then into that bottle, you're adding what's called the liqueur de tirage. And liqueur de tirage is a blend of wine, sugar, and yeast cells. So why are you adding, and then you cap it with a bottle cap and you, you leave it to age. 
So why do you do this? Because you're basically recreating that process of the second fermentation happening um, by adding new yeasts, new sugars, new nutrient, nutrients, so that those yeast cells start to ferment again in the closed area of this single bottle. Now, because you're in such a small space, the, uh, the ratio of yeast cells to wine is much, much greater than you would get in, in like a barrel, for example, or in a large tank. So uh, this is the point at which you allow the yeast to ferment the alcohol or ferment the sugar into alcohol, release CO2. Because that CO2 can't leave the bottle, it gets dissolved into the wine, creating the bubbles. And then you just let it sit there. And this is a very important part of the traditional method process. Um, pretty much all traditional method wine requires that you let those bottles sit there for at least nine months. Because during that nine months minimum, what happens is those yeasts have finished fermenting the additional sugar into alcohol. They've got nothing else to eat. They start to die and they start to dissolve and basically break down. This process is called autolysis. The yeast cells and the sort of particulates of the yeast then become integrated into the wine. And this, this process is what defines those aromas and those flavors that you get when you drink champagne that kind of remind you of pastry dough or yeast or, um, or brioche. These are the common, uh, the common, descriptors that we use to, to identify this particular style and the particular flavor profile, right? So this is the most important part. And the ratio of how much you get out of that wine, um, how much of that experience is, is linked directly to how long you leave that, that bottle um, and those yeast cells to dissolve in the wine. So the longer you leave it, the more kind of brioche uh, it gets, right? So that's just an important factor to know. Very, very important, the lady's aging. So then what happens when you're ready to, you know, open the wine or, or sell it, you can't just do that because you basically have still have a bunch of dead yeast cells in the bottle, which nobody really wants. It makes the wine cloudy. It, it doesn't look good. And you don't really want, it's kind of gritty. You know, you don't want to taste that. So you have to get rid of those dead yeast cells. And you do that by basically, um, over time, a process called riddling. So you can see here, it's, it's like these pupitras are these, these little TP shaped, um, wooden structures that have holes that the bottles fit into. And over time, they used to do this by hand all the time. It's crazy. I mean, it's just like you just imagine the carpal tunnel happening, but you basically turn it, turn each bottle uh, like a very, like an eighth of a, a circle around and you angle it just a little bit up. And every single bottle, they have to do this. Like every week or so, they do a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more until finally the bottle is just sitting straight up and down. And all of the yeast cells, all of the dead yeast cells have now collected in the neck of the bottle. Um, and so once that process is complete, it can take a very long time if you're doing it by hand, or if you're modern, which most people are, you use something called a Giro pallet, which does it automatically. That's those big box things that sort of um, every like 15 minutes or so, they'll move around and do the exact same process, but automatically via computer. And it takes like what would normally take three months and now only takes like three days. So it's a hugely uh, you know, efficient way of uh, of riddling your, your traditional method sparkling wine. Um, so after you've finished that, and the French term for that is called remuage, which I also just like the French terms, they're fun to say. Um, then after that, you now have to, like a little capsule of yeast cells that are stuck in the neck of the bottle, you have to get rid of them. And that's through a process called disgorgement or degorgement. And um, usually you do this because now, if you remember, there's just bottle caps on here. So if you're doing it by hand, what you do is basically pop open the bottle <laughs> And um, usually you're going to freeze the neck of the bottle, which will then freeze that clump of uh, yeast cells together into, into a more solid unit. When you pop open the bottle, the, basically that, that little plug of yeast cells just like shoots right out. And um, surprisingly, you don't tend to lose a lot of liquid from that because if you've chilled it down appropriately, really you're just expelling the, the capsule of yeast cells, but there is still a little bit of um, space in the top of the bottle that you need to fill. So at that point, you add your dosage. Um, dosage is generally a bit of still wine with some sugar in it. And the amount of sugar that's in that dosage is what determines the sweetness level 
in the finished champagne. So you'll notice sometimes that um, sparkling wines will have a name on there. And we're going to talk about this next, um, like that says brut or dry or extra dry. And this is determined by the amount of sugar that's in that dosage part of the process. Finally, after you've added your dosage, you then cork the bottle with a very special mushroom cork under pressure. You add that little cage on there, you twist it up, and then you get it ready to sell. So that is the process of traditional method sparkling wine. Super fun and fascinating. So the sweetness levels of, of those, as I mentioned, are dependent on how much sugar is added to that dosage. And um, traditionally, I mean, you'll see brute and extra brute are very, very common these days. Sweeter styles of wine used to be more popular. They're definitely on the down low. I always think it's very interesting because it basically goes, <laughs> Um, dew is going to be your sweetest, and that's going to have 50 grams of sugar per liter, which is a lot. Um, then demi sec is going to be kind of like your off draw or like your medium sweet, I'm sorry, you should say, which is about 32 to 50 grams. Um, you've got your sec, which means dry, but that actually means that there's between 17 and 32 grams of sugar per liter. And it's hard to, it's hard to really identify and compare that to like what you're talking about. When you're talking about like soda, for example, and how much sugar is in soda, I mean, there's quite a bit. And so it's that same idea. The reality is in that most in particular with champagne, because these wines are usually so high in acidity, specifically from champagne where it's so cold and the climate really adds acidity to those base wines, you're not going to notice the sugar as much as you would with a sparkling wine made in a warmer climate. So as you start to go uh, with lower levels, so dry or sec is actually more sweet than brut. Um, so brut is drier than dry. <laughs> Extra brut is drier than brut, and then brut nature, um, which is very trendy right now, and is also better with wines made again in warmer regions because they tend to be made with riper grapes that naturally have higher sugar content um, and just more fruit flavor, not as harsh of acidity. So brut nature means that you're not adding any sugar at all to your sparkling wine. So if you are someone who's looking to not introduce additional sugar into your, your dietary experience, brut nature is the way to go. And I, it also is a, is a really, uh, it, I, I, I mean, it can be a very, a very assertive um, level of sort of acidity, but uh, also is very, very enjoyable as far as I'm concerned. Um, another fun thing just about sparkling wines in general is usually the size of these bottles. So I'm sure, and this, I mean, you have bottle sizes that exist for not just for sparkling, but for all still wines as well. And um, I just have here the little picture of the different names and how, how big they are. But you've got basically um, all the way from your little, little quarter bottle. You see this a lot with, with sparkling wines, um, all different sizes. So you have all the way from your little quarter bottle, which is basically a split, to um, to a Solomon and larger. And the names are super interesting, but the largest one is of course that 18 liters, which is just your like 24 bottles of wine in one giant bottle. And it's basically as tall as I am. And you're just like, how do, how do you pour that? Um, and it's interesting because if you've seen that, and I, I've only seen pictures of it, but um, in really, really fancy restaurants when they do like a New Year's and they have these giant Solomons or Nebuchadnezzar's uh, bottles that are that hold so much wine, you can't lift it as a, as a single person. They actually have contraptions that look like little catapults that you basically have to put them in there. Oh, thank you, Daniel. Yes, 39 grams of sugar and 12 ounces of Coke. Thank you. <laughs> Good to know. I'm not sure how that what that translates to in terms of grams per liter, but... Um, I can figure that out and get back to you. <laughs> but um, the idea that you have this weird, uh, this weird actual contraption that will hold the wine, you can tilt it and pour it into, I don't know, I, if you can even pour it into a glass, because I think the, the mouth of the bottle is like that big. It's insane. So um, at any rate, the three specific types of sparkling, um, of uh, traditional method sparkling wines that we're going to talk about today, of course, are champagne, Cremant and Cava. Um, so Champagne is, of course, a region in France. And it's also the ubiquitous term for traditional method sparkling wine. Now, Champagne is also one of the best marketed regions in the entire, wine regions in the entire world. They have done an amazing job at basically uh, protecting their name and their product, right? Because they want to be known as the, uh, the traditional method sparkling wine, but they are Champagne. And they are the only ones who are Champagne. So just as a reference, because it does get confusing for a lot of people, sometimes you will still see on bottles in California labeled California Champagne. Now this is not true. In order for Champagne, in order for any wine to be Champagne, it must come from this region in France. 
It has to. California champagne is not actually, it's California sparkling. Unfortunately, um, this was, this is actually a, basically a global law too, um, that unfortunately um, <laughs> the United States decided not to uh, acknowledge. <laughs> So there's three countries in the world uh, that aren't, don't follow this regulation that was basically put out by the EU as sort of a name protectorate for champagne, and that is um, the United States, Argentina, and Russia. So they still use the term champagne on their labels, even though technically we're not allowed to, but you know. Um, but just so you're aware, it can only come from, to be champagne, it has to come from that place in France. Um, and for it to be champagne, again, it has that regulation of, uh, for that time on the lees, a minimum of 12 months. Uh, for non-vintage champagnes. And to be perfectly honest, that is, that is bare, bare minimum. Um, many, many producers, and this is true in all cases, will choose to extend the time on the lees based on whatever they feel like they want their experience to be for the wine. So again, the longer you leave it on there, the more texture and the more um, influence you get from those yeast cells, which is really, really cool. And if that's what you're going for, you want to spend as much time as possible. Now, uh, when you're in Champagne and you're making Champagne, there are three grapes that you use, which is Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and Meunier. Um, these grapes are are generally considered the, the typical wines for traditional method sparkling wine. So even, for example, in California, you'll see most sparkling wines being made with a blend of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. And yes, that Pinot Noir is generally vinified as a white wine. So it's completely pressed off the skins, vinified as a white wine without any sort of influence. Um, Oh, so uh, regarding the warmer climate, so it's a warmer climate has more sugar, but it'll be eaten up by the double fermentation. So it's not any sweeter, just more fruity and less acid driven. Yes. So when you're talking about traditional methods, sparkling wines from warmer climates, what you're getting is those grapes that you're picking tend to already be a little bit riper. So they're naturally going to have a little bit more sugar in them. And also they're not going to have as high of acidity. Because if we remember, the riper your sugars get, as your, as your sugars ripen, your acidity starts to drop. So in those colder climates, you're picking grapes that have naturally just like teeth scraping acidity, like really, really aggressive acidity. In those warmer climates, you're not going to have as high of acid. So you don't need as much sugar in your dosage for example, and or you would taste that sugar a little bit more. Um, in those typical places, that's why you won't see a whole lot of um, sex coming out of, for example, Spain, which is what I'm drinking right here with the cava, where it tends to be a little bit warmer. You mostly just see your brutes your extra brutes and your brut dosages. Um, so in Champagne as well, you might see other things on the label, like for example, Blanc de Blanc, which means that it is a wine that's made from only white grapes, so only Chardonnay. Uh, Blanc de Noir, which means that it's only made from uh, black grapes, so either Pinot Noir or Meunier or a blend of that. Non-vintage, which is what most champagne is, because that means it's a blend of different years. You always have reserve wines in champagne and they use those in the wines to create the perfect blend and flavor. So it's consistent from year to year. Then you have your vintage champagne, and um, which means that all of the grapes, all of the wine has come from the same year, which is the opposite of what your non-vintage is. And then you have your tete de cuvee, which is generally the highest, um, the highest label, like the most, the prestige label of any particular champagne house. So method champagne, method champenois, is the what the traditional method used to be referred to as. So in, um, in the 70s, actually, champagne as a region petitioned to have the term method champenois struck in from any sort of global uh, reference because they wanted to protect the champagne name. And so um, uh, the method champenois or champagne method is technically not supposed to be used anymore, but that's exactly what the traditional method is. It is what used to be referred to as the champagne method or the method champenois. Um, and 106 of grams per liter of sugar and Coke, that is a lot. That's definitely do, guys. Do. Um, so that is champagne, that is in France. Um, then we have Cremant. So Cremant is also made in France, and it's the, the term that was basically also in the 70s when Champagne decided they weren't going to let anyone else use the uh, Method Champenois uh, title. Um, they also agreed to let other sparkling wines using the same method call themselves Cremant, and that Champagne would not use the term Cremant. So, but really what we're referring to is a sparkling wine made in other places of France, other than Champagne, that uses the same traditional method. Um, some of your most typical ones are going to be uh, Cremant de Bourgogne, Cremant de Bordeaux, Cremant de Alsace, uh, Cremant de Loire, uh, Cremant de Lemieux, Cremant de Jure, and Cremant de Savoie. So all of these guys basically are different winemaking regions in France, and those all have their only... <laughs> 
<laughs> um, the, so all of those different uh, regions make their own sparkling wine in the traditional method. And so it's, it's interesting, they all still require a minimum nine months because that's kind of the, the minimum amount of time you need to get that aut autolytic character from the yeast cells. Um, but each different region basically has different authorized grape, grape varietals that they will use. For example, in your uh, Cremont uh, de Loire's, you'll see more Chenin Blanc because that's a very typical white grape of the region. Uh, in Cremont d'Alsace, they use Pinot Blanc a lot, um, or Augerois. Um, so it all depends on where it's being made, uh, is what, what varietal goes into there. But they all need nine months on the lees. And they generally, what happens with Cremont and the Cremont de la Mou, yes, Angela, um, the, the Cremont from France because they're made in the same process um, there's definitely they have the same characteristics but they often cost a lot less <laughs> and they're often just they're delicious wines um, so they represent really really good value if you happen to like champagne but don't have champagne budget um, <laughs> Um, Non-dosage or uh, non-dosé non means basically brute zero, so there's no dosage in there, no sugar added. And French champagne being less bubbly than California champagne, I think it sometimes depends on the characteristics of the bubbles too, because when you're drinking bubbly wine, if it has um, the uh, the the mousse of the of the wine, the sort of delicacy of the bubbles is dependent is directly related to the quality of the wine. So kind of the longer that a wine sits on its lees aging, the more delicate the bubbles will be or the more kind of creamy the mousse will be. Um, Cremant, Cremant does sort of refer to kind of a creaminess, but not all Cremant is necessarily as creamy. Um, it depends on who's making it and how long it stays on the lees. But it's really the ability for that, uh, how long the carbon dioxide has to sort of dissolve into the wine uh, that gives it a more delicate mousse. Um, whereas if it has less time, it might be a little bit more aggressive, we call it, which is a little bit more bursty or a little bit more bubbly. Um, so, but you want, the goal is to have your bubbles be persistent. You want them to continuously evolve. You don't want to just like a burst, like you're opening a can of soda and then it goes flat right away. So that again is directly related to how long it spends on the lees and how long the carbon dioxide has to dissolve in the wines itself. And then finally, cava, which is what I am drinking. Cava is traditional method sparkling wine that is only from Spain. And this was first created in the, in the 1800s. So in 1872, there was a man called Josep Raventosi Fajot. And he actually went to, um, he went to Champagne and he loved it. And then he brought the method back to, to Spain and made the first sparkling wine in Spain in 1872. And then in uh, several years later, uh, 16 years later, his son in 1888 made the first sparkling wine in Spain using only native Spanish varietals. And this is what Cava is today. It's based on native Spanish varietals of Macabeo, Parallada, and Jarelo. Um, so it's interesting because it used to, cava used to be called the champagne of Spain until they weren't allowed to use the term champagne anymore. Um, so the name, the term cava actually refers to the caves they were aged in. And that is what eventually they decided to call it when they couldn't call it champagne. Well, I'll, we'll definitely talk about global warming in a second. Um, but uh, cava comes from uh, it can be made in seven different autonomous regions of Spain from these native varietals and from other varietals as well. Um, but 95% of it comes from the region of Penedes, which is in Catalonia, sort of that north eastern area that's just next to the south of Spain. So, and how does global warming affecting champagne? Um, just the same way I... To be honest, uh, I think it really depends individually on your vineyards, where your vineyards are located, and how much the global warming is affecting those individual um, mesoclimates, but the reality is, is that generally speaking, with global warming, grapes are getting riper. Um, great, they're able to ripen grapes more fully. So in Champagne, where you're depending on sort of less ripe grapes, or you're looking for higher acidity in your, in your grapes, that might mean that you're starting to pick your grapes earlier because they're ripening earlier, if you're trying to keep that acidity. Or similarly, you're gonna start to see more non-dosage or Brut Zero or Brut Nature wines coming out of Champagne, when they used to not be able to make that because the natural acidity in those wines was just so bracing that they couldn't really handle. It wouldn't be balanced if you didn't add a dosage, right? So so there's kind of like that um, that process there. So um, that is that is it, everybody. I am now done Woo! with that. <laughs> so uh, I want to say thank you all very much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Um, cheers to everyone.
And um, I mean, yeah, happy Wednesday. <laughs>